do is uh, turn the mic over to Izzy Lifshitz, who many of you know uh, because he is also on our executive committee, is very involved in Smiling Seniors. But one of the projects that he's very involved in as well is our tech tutoring program, which is on pause because of the coronavirus. Although I got an email today that somebody is really, two people are really waiting for it to come back. So maybe we'll have to figure out how to do it virtually. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Izzy is going to talk today about some very practical tips in regards to internet safety and, and just watching ourselves and the different platforms and things that are out there. Um, and this is a talk, not because he studied and went to school to be a security expert, but practically this is things that he has, has put into his own um, practices of life. So I'm gonna share the uh, spotlight with Izzy and uh, thank you, Izzy. Okay, I am going to mute everybody. And the, oh, Navy's done it, that's good. And I just hope that you've got uh, pencil and paper handy because when I go through um, a slide and you can't to... hear you. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? I hear you. Hand? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. So you have a pencil and paper so that you can make a note of, of the slide and we can go back and discuss it and explain it. When I was thinking about this uh, presentation today, um, it's not easy to come across with all the terminology that you're coming across. And it brings me back to the days when I was a youngster, when I was in the company of my Boba and Zeta. And particularly my Boba would always come up with words. She would say, he's a kvetch, or the tchotchkes are around here, or the schmutz that you're leaving. So these are words that came to me when I was a youngster. Later on, we added words to the dictionary that we understand. For, the, for example, the word Google. If you say to someone, Google something, they know exactly what you're talking about. If you say Xerox something, they know exactly what you're talking about. But now in 2020 on the internet, you have new words that we haven't heard. Phishing, web address, scams, SMS, cookies. So hopefully in my presentation, I'll explain some of these words to you. I don't expect you to um, understand them at the first time. It takes a long time um, to understand. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so each of my slides has a number in the top left corner. If you want me to come back to a slide, just mark down that number. I'm going to make this available as a PDF document. And any of you who would like to uh, review it in your own time, we will email it to you. And at the end, if you have anything private that you would like me to discuss or help you with, I can do it with you afterward. So what is practicing safe internet? So we have viruses, ransomware, phishing, and I'm hoping to explain all these to you. Malware things that come on your phone, on your computer, on your tablet. They are everywhere. So I'm trying to point out to make you safe um, when using your devices today. So how safe are you in 2020? You can see on my picture on the right, I see it, I re-uploaded 2019 because 2020 has a virus. So I'm not referring to your physical safety or your mental safety, but rather to your hidden safety, personal information, the things you cannot see but could come back to haunt you. So I've been involved in technology since the mid-70s, 
And I've seen the growth of technology as well as its inroads into our personal lives. Things that we take for granted that we shouldn't. And the views and opinions I express today are mine, based on many years working in tech, working with people, working with real people, and seeing where the technology has helped and where it's invaded our privacy and stolen from us. So I'm going to start with a little poem. So once upon a time when Windows was just a square hole in a room and an application was something written on paper, when a keyboard was a piano and a mouse was an animal, when a file was an important document and a hard drive was an uncomfortable road trip, when cut was done with a knife and paste was done with glue, when the web was a spider's home and the virus was a flu, when apple and blackberry were just fruits, that's when we had a lot of time for family and friends. I really like this because it really describes what's going on here. So what's going on here? How safe are you? How safe is your personal information? At the top level, I would say that the IRS and Medicare are the most secure as they have the most complete information about you. They know everything. The government's computers are so old they are difficult to hack. So we must accept that our information is safe here, even if you feel your constitutional rights have been infringed upon. But what about other places that have your information? So on the second level, I've put banks and credit card companies. They also have all your personal information, yet their networks are a target and they still get breached and information stolen. What is a breach? These are the smart Alex sitting in a darkened room in front of a bank of computers that are programmed to scan the World Wide Web for any vulnerabil vulnerabilities. 24-7, 365 days a year. Any tiny crack will allow them entry into a computer and copy data within a couple of minutes. And that data has a high value on the dark web. So if you hear of a breach, it's an immediate warning to change your passwords and check your information. So these are the guys sitting in these darkened rooms, looking at your bank accounts, looking at your social security, looking at your credit card numbers. These all have value. So on the second level are the banks, credit cards, and brokerage firm. They also have all your information. Computers from these institutions are cons consistently, constantly being scoured for any possible way to break in. Should we hate these fishers on the dark web or should we call them fishers? I think we should love them. If it weren't for them, these institutes would leave the door to your vault wide open and insecure. Yes, this is the reason that the banks have tightened their security. On the third level are other credit cards, Target, Safeway, Steinmark, Southwest, Yes cards. Why do these companies offer credit cards? For one reason only, they make money off it by selling your information. And these fall into the category of least secure. I'm going to play you a video by my 11 year old grandson telling you how corporations are ripping us off. This is a 340 pack, or so it seems, that my brother got at Costco. You know, personally, I love double bubbles. Except my brother counted all of these. Well, plus a few that we ate. As you may see, 
all of them are in stacks of 10, except for the other one, which is a stack of 8. So if you do the math, it's 338, which is not 338. So he did this all on his own. And he's realized that corporations are shortchanging us. Another place to look where your information is, is uh, leaking is auto pay, which to me is legalized corporate theft. So auto, auto pay is fantastic. You can auto pay your electricity. You can auto pay your uh, phone bill. You can auto pay the gas bill. But this gives the company the right to bill you forever and ever without, without any consequence. And if you do find an error, it's very difficult for you to get them to correct it. So in the long term, I do not advocate order pay. I advocate looking for your, your uh, monthly invoices checking them and paying them. The only company I found that has never billed me more than they're supposed to is T-Mobile. So in the old days, a theft was when someone broke into your office or your, your home and they, they stole something. Today, it's the silent, stealthy thief. Our alarm systems need to be on 24-7. How can we protect your, your information? The first step should be a credit freeze. Freeze your personal data, and that goes for all members of your family. So there are three credit reporting agencies, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. If you're comfortable, you can log on to each of these agencies and you can freeze the information yourself. If not, you can call them and they'll do it for you over the phone. But be aware, this does take time and you'll need to provide a lot of information so they can verify that it's really you. <clears throat> Once it's done, your personal information is locked and you will be notified if anyone tries to access it. So don't go and try and buy a car without first unlocking. And when you do unlock, it's on a temporary basis, specifying who the lock is for and for how long. It's very safe. Alerts. I think I've spoken about alerts before. Each and every bank and financial institution credit card has an alert system available to you free of charge. <clears throat> I recommend you activate these. You can either do it yourself online or you can call the financial institution and they'll walk you through setting up the alerts. Alerts are either text or emails which alert you when anything happens on your account. So you can see this little block in the top here, which says, hi, Ken, this is Eno. Did you make a purchase from Camera Supply Store? So you sometimes might consider these a pain, but if there's a legitimate or a fraudulent transaction, you would be notified within 30 seconds of it happening. If it's a transaction you do not recognize, you have the opportunity of contacting the financial institution and asking them to take care of it. All you do is call the number that's on the back of your credit card and ask for the fraud department. And they'll walk you through or they will do the necessary steps. 99% of the time, they will reverse these transactions without any cost to you. And it's really quite easy to do. So these are text alerts. SMS messages. We have to watch for scams. I received a text message just last week 
from the current census de department asking me to verify my telephone number. Well, the census department's never gonna text me. They don't even have my telephone number. So you've got to be careful. <clears throat> Remember the IRS, Apple, Microsoft, Medicare, a financial institution will never contact you via text message, email or phone to ask for personal information. They will always contact you using regular mail. So just the other day, I got an, a call from Apple telling me to stop using my Apple devices until I call them. The funny thing is the only Apple I have in my house is one that I can eat. So on the right-hand side, you can see here a sample text message, your Apple ID is due to expire. So, and it's asking you to click on this link and I'm gonna come and explain to you in a few slides time what that link is. And the, the alert that's at the bottom, <clears throat> which is you've selected to win 175, yeah, it was a 1.75 million on a coat uh, promo. We should all be so lucky. These are samples of alerts that I have from my credit card company that comes through. On the left over here, this is from Capital One. You can see the date and it says there was $5.41 spent on Amazon. And then a little bit later, there was $3.51 on Amazon and then $81 on Amazon. And on the right is from my Costco card. All of these alerts are the same, telling me the balance on the cards $131, of course, because I didn't spend anything. <clears throat> so these are the samples of alerts that you would be getting. Let's get on to email now. And this is a very, very important subject. What is phishing? What is a scam? This is when an outside agent is trying to get something from you. How can you spot these and how do they get your information? So on an email, and this works for any type of email, the first thing you should do is check the sender address. If the sender address is unknown to you, <clears throat> be careful. Do not open the email. Delete it. And always take a moment to see, to examine where the email is coming from. And I will show you examples. Unusual sender addresses. Take a close at this, take close, excuse me, take a close, close look at this address. And it should be a red flag. Z A E P da 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 something developed. A, nobody who is in their same mind would create an email address like that. The key also <clears throat> is to look at the last letters on the right hand side of the email address, which you can see in this case is .eu. And that's telling me that this, someone in, the, in Europe is sending me this message. And I've highlighted some other extensions JP would be Japan, <clears throat> MX would be Mex Mexico, um, IL would be Israel, KR would be Korea. <clears throat> if you're ever unsure where these orange origins are, you can always Google it. And you Google a domain .jp, Google will tell you where it is. Next thing, when you get an email, is to look in the body of the email. Today, a lot of emails contain pictures and graphics. And what the scammers do, they place a tracking bot in the picture. A tracking bot is a piece of computer information that when you click on the picture, it starts to collect your information. You can see it, you can hear it, you don't even know that it's working. <clears throat> so many of these emails, they look perfect. And 
So you need to check, and I'm going to show you some examples of what to look for. Okay. So in this email <clears throat> that came to me, it says, welcome to provide auto insurance. Now look at this email address here where it says provide auto, where it's highlighted in red. The minute you see an email that looks like this, it's not, it's a scam. They, they're looking for something. If I scroll down this email and I look at this here, <clears throat> this is a picture. How can I tell it's a picture? If you look very closely, particularly where it says start here, you'll see there's like little grainy dots. That's the dots of the picture. So the other way you could tell if it's a picture is if you try to copy and paste these words, you can't do it. So you, you've got to be careful in looking at it. When I go further down, I start looking here and it gives me, <coughs> excuse me, it gives me an address. Next to the address, there's this button that says unsubscribe. Do never, never, ever unsubscribe. That is activating the bot in your email. Anywhere you see there where it says, in the next highlight where it says, just tell me, same thing. If you go down this email, now you'll see the garbage that's, that's in the email. So you can tell that this is a scam. So I'm going to go to another one. Burial insurance, same thing. Have a look at this email address that's highlighted there. It's, it's complicated. Nobody's going to make an email address like that. <clears throat> the same thing when you look at this blue $1 buys you $100 million or whatever it is. That's a picture. And when you go further down, there's the key where they're asking you to click on something to take your information. And the body of the email, again, has junk. Where does registration? Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> ADT, a very well-known security company. Have a look at the email address. The end of this email address says .org, .org. <clears throat> .org is usually reserved for a charitable or non-profit organization. So it would never come from a company. Scrolling down through the picture. This over here, I can see it, I hope you can. If you look at it, there's little tiny dots on it. It's not text, it's a picture. It's not text. And again, when I go down, there's the key, unsubscribe here. Do not touch that button. Okay, here's another good one. <clears throat> this is when I've won something. So the first thing is look at the email address. I also have a look under that at the other people who were in there. And if you look at the two letters that are after the period, there's .ch, which is Switzerland, .jp, which is Japan, .uk, which is the, the United Kingdom, uh, .ru, which is Russia. So I have been included with all of these people who are getting the same email. Again, confirm your information. No way. Never, ever do that. So the bad thing about this email is 
that they do have my email address. I don't know how they got it, but they do have it. But I haven't given them anything back over here. Okay, Geico. Again, look at the email address. This is not a Geico email address. When you go down, get a quote is a problem. And here you get the links that you click. Why would you have coupon tickets for Geico insurance? So as you can see, they're very, very smart and it's very tricky. <clears throat> I'm just going to take a sip of water. I'm now going to go on to web browsing. So when you surf the web, it seems innocent enough. However, they're collecting information about you, lots of information. Have you ever seen on the website, it comes up and it says, this site uses cookies, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what is a cookie? It's not something you can eat. So a cookie is to help the website keep track of you keep track of your activity, which isn't a bad thing. For example, if you shop online at Amazon or whatever, they use cookies to keep track of what's in your shopping cart. They use cookies to keep track of what you've purchased before. They use cookies to keep track of, say, you might like this. You understand? But cookie, oops, sorry, I jumped. Cookies can also collect information. So I'm not going to give too much detail about cookies because they're tough and it's a lesson on its own. And cookies reside on your computer, your tablet, your cell phone, every single device. So the browsers that you use have an option to you, you not to turn them off, but more to limit what they can do. And as I've written down the bottom here, this is another lesson on its own, uh, how to turn them off, how to clear the cookies and what the effect is. Uh, just a quick note, if you go and clear cookies, the next time you log into your bank, for example, where you used to have your username come up, that'll be gone. When, you'd have to enter it again. When you log, log into Amazon, it's going to ask you for your username and password again. That's what happens when you get rid of cookies. So when you open up a web browser, this is technical. When I go to permissions, these are the files that look like cookies. And on the right hand side, it gives me the option to remove all or to remove particular ones. And again, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but these are the options that they allow you to have. A web address. I would like to explain to you what a web address is and how to look at it, because this is actually important. The same way as you have a social security number or you have a telephone number, that is dedicated to you directly. Um, the same on the internet. A web address is dedicated to one particular place. If you want to go to CNN, you want to go to Apple, you want to go to Amazon, you, you put in Amazon.com, the computer translates it and takes you there. So when you look at a, a, um, a web address, the HTTP, which is the protocol, there are two types, HTTP, and if you look below, HTTPS. The difference is the S means secure, secure. Be very aware on the internet if you buy something and you get to the shopping cart and it does not say HTTPS. It is an unsecure site, very important. So 
when you, uh, uh, just briefly on a web address, HTTPS is the protocol, www is the World Wide Web, Google will be where I want to go to, .com is the extension, .org, .jp, .whatever, and index.html is a particular file where you want to look for something, and that becomes complicated. So remember, you all, when you're shopping, you always want to make sure you look for HTTPS. So what is a safe web address? In the top over here, this is uh, Amazon Smile. So the first thing is I'm looking for that lock. That lock must be closed. That means this is a secure site. So the second one, if you can look at it, is capital one, the lock is closed. So if it's locked at the bottom, it's safe. If it's read or unlocked, it's an unsafe website. Fake web addresses. Well, if you have a look at this one very quickly, it looks like HTTP steam community.com. But if you look carefully, the word community is spelt incorrectly. And that is a key that this is a fake web address. And again, this, this uh, um, computer had um, anti-spam software, so it marked, as, as marked it as unsafe. But you have to look at that. And I'm going to show you more. Facebook. When you look at Facebook over here, it looks good. It look, they've stolen the exact colors of Facebook, the font, and everything. But when you look at the, uh, the web address carefully, look at the top what it looks like. This is not Facebook. If it was Facebook, it would say www.facebook.com slash something else. So this is a phishing website, fake website. If you look at this one, very carefully. What have they done here? It's not Facebook, it's Facebook. Again, it's spelled incorrectly. Got to be careful. Ah, Amazon. Looks perfect if you've shopped on Amazon. But have a look in the red box. It doesn't say Amazon, it says Amazon X. So people are grabbing names they changing the names to look very similar and using them as their websites. And I don't know how many people have seen this. Your computer's been locked because you've been watching uh, pornography, blah, 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 and you need to pay them $200, but it has to be from a card from CVS, Kmart, Apple, or whatever. This is just phishing a scare tactic. Please do not fall for it. Please do not fall for it. Fake messages. So here your computer might also give you um, uh, another way of, of uh, describing an unsafe or fake website. Get a message. I'm going to now touch on logins and passwords. Uh, each and every website you log into requires a username and password, which is a necessary evil. So how do we keep sanity with all of this? Subscribe to a password program, a paid program. The information you're storing in these programs is too critical for a free program. And these would be something like Keeper or Dashlane. And I'm going to come and show you these. When these are set up correctly, the information is available on all devices, computer, tablet, and phone. Use these programs to, saw, to store information about logins, websites, anything. And you can also store information about financial institutions. 
So these programs generate a very complicated password. And then you use this program to log into your bank so that the password can not be uh, grabbed. This is a sample screen from Keeper. On the left hand side are Amazon, Apple, Bank of America, Chase Bank are places where I want to keep data for each one of them. When I click on this one, it says my bank website in the, on the right hand side. The first line would have the name my bank website. The second line would have the, the web address of the bank. The third line would have your login. And the fourth line would be this crazy password that this program would generate for you. And then I can store for myself the account number. I can even take a photograph of the, of the credit card for the bank and store it with the information here. So you can have everything in one record for each institution. Logins and passwords. This is a real pain in the rear end. If you want to maintain a, a, the password the old fashioned way, here's a tip I can offer you to make it a little bit easier. All logins, almost all logins have a basic minimum requirement. That's at least eight characters long, one uppercase, one number, and one symbol. All of them have that. So here's my formula, and you can use it in any order you like. Find a, wo a word. So I pick Menasha Rivka. That's the word. I then need an uppercase. So I uppercase the M. I need a number. So I put 18 at the end. And then I need a symbol. So I put the pound sign. So this is a very secure password. But what happens when the website comes back to you and says you need to change the password for some reason? Very simple. All I do is go in again and the new password be password would be <clears throat> instead of 18 would be 19. Instead of 19 would be 20. Instead of 20 would be 21. And then at 22, I'll come back to 18. So you have five passwords that you need to remember. What's my recommendation? You must make, I suggest you make a comprehensive list of all your websites, all your passwords. And I would recommend this list be part of your will. And in this way, the executor can cancel and close any accounts without any additional charges to the estate. Otherwise, if you've got auto pay or something like that, they will just continue billing. So I've given you a ton of information to absorb and I'll make this presentation available to you so you can read through it. Um, on the right here is just a sample um, form <clears throat> that you can use to fill in the website, the username <clears throat> and the password. So Fred, what's Fred? Funny, ridiculous electronic devices. And if you've got a little one, I call it Alfred, which is a little funny, ridiculous electronic device. So devices should be shut off, not put to sleep at least once every 24 hours. Devices have a memory and from constant use, data fills these memory cells. Just like humans, these cells can become confused. We need only one bit of information to be misplaced and the device starts acting up. It's pretty human. So restarting the device clears the memory and starts the device with a clear mindset. <clears throat> Number two, each time you start a device, there are certain tasks that are performed in the background. These make the device operate better. These can be system updates and file cleaning. You don't leave your car running overnight, so why your electronics? So if you remember these two tips, 
you've now passed computer tech 101. When a device doesn't seem to operate properly, shut it down and restart. So the SOS Tech Tutors program that I've, uh, in, sorry, through the program, I've come across many seniors who've been given a hand-me-down phone or a computer or a tablet. This is great. However, most of them have never been cleaned up of the previous user's data. So I've always advocated a protocol of KISS. Keep it simple and stupid. Get rid of anything you don't need. Devices work better if the excess baggage is clear. Most of my pupils at Tech Tutor classes have needed their devices to be uncluttered. And this includes email, text, photos. Make a habit of this. If there's an app or a program you don't use, delete it. You can always get it back. And empty the trash. That's why you put things in the trash. Think of these devices as a gallon bottle of milk. You cannot put two gallons into a gallon bottle of milk. The same with the devices. So I've come across some devices that have over 200,000 emails. Nobody needs that number of emails, not even presidential candidates. But in this case, it's legal for you to delete them. So this is a familiar <coughs> thing here. Uh, that happens all the time. I get your, I get the new phone. Shalom gets my phone. Rivka gets Shalom's phone. Menachem gets Rivka's phone. And you get his phone and dad, you get to pay for it all. Does that sound familiar? So some final thoughts. SOS uh, uh, tech tutors, including myself and Rabbi Levy and our other volunteers are here to help you with the technology. We do not want to access your personal information. I need to show you how to access it and make it more secure. We will offer this on a one-on-one -on -one basis when we can. Unfortunately, we cannot be there next to you. So we accomplish this with your permission by accessing your computer or your tablet remotely, but right in front of you. Uh, this would not be available for cell phones yet. Alternatively, we will be glad to chat with you on the phone and guide you. I've provided you a lot of information and there's still much more we can do. This is just a starting point. So SOS AZ, keeping you informed and safe. And a good Shabbos. I'm now opening, I'm opening the uh, forum. You can unmute, unmute your mics. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. I, I have something to add to your presentation. Um, frequently, you'll get an email, not frequently, but an email from a credit card company or a bank. It'll look like it's from the bank until you see the email address, which is correct. But instead of just deleting it, I will call the credit card company or the bank and offer to forward that email to them to their fraud department so they can do a check. You can do that right exactly. The other thing you can do as well is each and every one of these institutions, so for example, Bank of America, if you reply, if you forward that email to abuse at Bank of right. America, it goes to the same department, or abuse at City Cards, or abuse at Capital One. So it's the same thing. Thank you, Rhoda. Oh, you're welcome. I have a question. Two questions, actually. We use Norton uh, antivirus, and is that I didn't hear you say anything about that type of system. Is that recommended by you? I actually have it listed in a couple of slides that I've left out. <laughs> ah. Yes, I use Norton. Um, I've been using Norton for I'm not sure 20 years, and um, I find it as good as any but it's still not complete. It still doesn't catch everything. You still have to be vigilant. Yes, a good antivirus program is a necessity. Right, There's yep. also anti-malware programs that you can get for free. Right. The other and question- they do work, I have. I have them. 
Yeah, the question I had was about the PayPal. Uh, I maybe misunderstood what you said. When you said, are you advocating paying bills over the computer? Are you saying you should go back to the old system of writing a check? No. The all, um, I've discussed it before. There are ways today to securely send money to people um, for paying of bills. So number one, uh, if you're uh, with your bank, your bank should have a, um, a section called bill pay. Mm -hmm. So in bill pay, bill pay <clears throat> is 100% secure because if you tell the bill to pay your electric bill on a certain date, but it doesn't get there and you get a penalty from the electric company for a late payment, the bank is responsible. So that is a good way to, to, um, to pay the bills uh, using bill pay. Uh, the other way is what happens if I owe you $40 and I want to pay you $40? There's a system that almost all the banks have called Zelle, Z-E-L-L-E. So once you have set up Zelle between me and you, That's I can easy. send you money. Z. So I send money to my kids. Um, I just use Zelle and it goes, they get a message. It's either, they get either a text message or an email that'll say you've been sent $50. And when they click on it, it automatically goes into their bank account. So the, the need for a check, um, uh, goes away. Uh, I'm speaking to Carol Webner as well. So yeah, so paying uh, PayPal, PayPal is 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 pretty secure. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. It's backed up by your credit card because you have to put your credit card in PayPal. So PayPal mm -hmm. is actually a mechanism to pay somebody. <clears throat> it's a mechanism to pay somebody. If you're still using your credit card. Right. Uh, just a quick jump in, Izzy. Uh, besides for sharing the PowerPoint, can you share it in the chat now as a file? Um, you know what? I have to um, compile it as a, a PDF. I haven't compiled it yet. Oh, okay. It's as, a, soon, as soon as file. I've compiled it, um, <clears throat> I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Okay, perfect. And let me do that now. And then a question that's in the chat. Yes. If someone uses WebRoot, which is provided by Best Buy. What are your thoughts on that program? I don't see that in the chat. No, it's a private one to me. So what is it called, WebRoot? WebRoot, and it's done by Best Buy, by the Geek Squad. It's an antivirus program. You know, I've got to tell you something. The Geek Squad was great for my business when I was doing it because I used to pick up all the mistakes they would make. <clears throat> you know, so it's, that's, it, it's, maybe they've gotten better today or something like that. They use that um, web route because their technicians have been trained in it. I'm presuming it's a good one. I'm not familiar with it. I'm not familiar with it, but I presume it should be okay. I have a question. Yes. Yes, Janet. Um, so I do a lot of auto pay through my um, Chase Bank, but mm -hmm. every single day, every day, I go to my um, Chase Bank and I see what's been deposited, what's been withdrawn, what checks have been cashed, et cetera, et cetera. So are you still saying that's not really a safe way to do it? No, not really. What I'm saying about auto pay is once you've given that company, um, the cell phone company or the TO Cox or whatever it is, the, the, the authorization to bill you, they will just bill you. And then when you see a problem, it's after the fact. So the biggest culprit mm -hmm. around here is Cox. You can be paying $80 a month for Cox, 
all of a sudden one month it's 140. So when you call them, they tell you, oh, your, your um, uh, promotion ran out or this or that, and then you've got to fight with them, whatever it is. Whereas I get Cox to email me the, the, the bill. I have a look at the bill. I see if it's correct. And then I go into either the, the bank or to Cox's website. And I say, on the 8th of August, you may withdraw $57. That's it, one time. And I do that with everything. And the only reason I don't do it with T-Mobile is because they have a fairly decent discount if you have auto pay. But as I said, with T-Mobile, it's the one company I found that never charged a dime more than a $70 a month contract, ever. Izzy, I have a lot of auto pay accounts and I generally get an email prior to it being charged to my credit card or to my bank account. So I think that's a pretty safe way of knowing what is going to show up. If, you, if you've been using it for a while and you're happy with it, I'm happy with it. Thank you. And, and my auto insurance and, and another one too will bill you $5 a month extra if they mail you an invoice. Right. But if they auto pay it, then it is reduced, and that's sixty dollars a year. But, so, but but again, like that other lady, I check every single account every single day. Right, uh, Rhoda. The other thing with insurance, I also have my insurance on auto pay, but I get an email from them maybe a week or ten days before they're going to draw it, saying right. this is what we're going to withdraw. So right. I get a. I do get a mail. Keep a check of that. <clears throat> but then there's SOS and they just take it out every month on a credit card. Well, we think we trust it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't pay my insurance automatically, but I do my credit card. My credit card, I get an, a, actually an invoice mailed to me that comes, let's say, the beginning of the month. And I know it's due, let's say, the 20 something of the month. I have that period of time to check it before they do anything and I can find any errors which is rare, but I can find any errors and contact them, and I haven't had a problem doing that. That's my situation. I have had, the only thing I have had is occasionally with my TV, where they will pre-bill, and if I call them and there's an error, they will give me a credit on the next month's bill. Right. So that I've done, but, but that's also rare. The, only, the biggest problem I have is when we were away and we have something on hold and there's a, a monthly hold fee when you're away. And when we're in Arizona, I have those charges. And I know that occasionally when I come back, there's kind of a bit of confusion and I call them and review everything to make sure that it's correct. But that's my system. It may not work for everyone. That's fine. It's good. Is it, late. You said something about don't press unsubscribe. Now right. that's you're talking about something that you don't know where like I joined the Nutrisystem. Well, right. I quit it. I want to unsubscribe that. Right. that that's but, good. That's okay. But again, I showed you some emails coming from legitimate companies, ADT, Geico. You, when you get that email from Nutrisystem, Make sure it's Nutrisystem, right. and then you can unsubscribe. Yes. Uh, okay. Make sure it's because right. people um, to collect your information, they will fake the Nutrisystem email web page, whatever it is, <clears throat> and, uh, and 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 take it away. So be careful. Again, I showed you in the presentation how to look at the address, uh -huh. and if it. The one from Geico was it was a classic. If you're going to get an email from Geico, it's going to come from Geico.com. If it comes from anywhere else, it's not Geico. So so be careful about that. Yeah, and a lot of things on Facebook that look very interesting to buy, and I've purchased a couple. Takes it takes months to get it. You've already paid, and it comes from China, and it's not even usable. I agree with you. I've, also, I've fallen prey once to uh, to a purchase on Facebook, and I challenged it with a credit card company. I bought a pair of shoes, and uh -huh. I challenged it with a credit card company because it was the wrong size. 
So the people said, yeah, you can send it back and we will give you a new pair. It cost so, you twice as much. No, the shoes cost me $60 and I had to send it to Shenzhen in China, which right. was $65. Right. And I said, no, eventually I fought it and fought it and fought it and they paid me back. So I was like, and I still have the shoes. So <laughs> now I learned to do it through PayPal right. if, it's on, if it's on Facebook. Judy, I've been waiting for you. Well, let me thank you for an informative session, and I definitely picked up some some um, tips from you. And you talked in such an easy to understand manner, because a lot of it is a little complicated. But every once in a while, I see something on an ad, and I uh, click on it. I maybe put my name on it, but then I get warning bells going off that I don't know. I don't like what they're asking me. You know, so I think one I remember, I think, was um, uh, car insurance. So I just got off of it. But I didn't press submit. I'm wondering, did they still store some of the information? You, you know what? The web designers are much smarter than you think. When you put in your name and you finish that field, they collect the information. One by one, you don't even have to finish everything. They'll they, they'll collect the information. So here's another little tip I'll give you. Mm -hmm. Go and get yourself another email address from AOL or Hotmail, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And when you get to these websites and you don't want to give them your address, mm -hmm. put in that other one. But if it becomes a website that you want to follow consistently, then you go into the website and say, change my email address, and then you put your real one in. So in that way, if they start oh. spamming you, it's going to somewhere where you don't, you don't care. So yeah. have a backup email address and don't put your name in the email address. You know, put, put the Phoenix lady at AOL.com or something right. like that. So that they don't, don't let your email address give away any information about you. Very good. And um, on Zelle, I thought you could only do um, transfer money to people that had a Bank of America account. Can no. that be used for different banks now? You can do it to anybody, just about anybody. So, so what, I do, what I do with Zelle, if I'm going to send money to a person the first time, okay, Let's say I want to send $100. Um, I will create the Zelle account and I'll send them $1. And then I'll find out, did you get it? And is it in your bank? And then I'll send them the 99 Because then you, okay. know, you know that you've opened the channel to the right person. You understand? So on a new Zelle, send a dollar. Because if you're out a dollar, you're out a dollar. It doesn't matter. But don't send the full amount on the mm -hmm. first time. So you, can, you can always do that later. In order to do that, uh, don't you have uh, to have I, their bank routing number? No, 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 no. no. The, when you, if I'm going to send you, Elaine, a Zelle transfer, when you get it, it's going to do two things. It's going to look, are you set up with Zelle? And if you're not, it's going to guide you through setting you setting yourself up with Zelle to where you want it deposited. That's what you can do. So that's what it does. And then once that's done, it's done. Zelle is quite easy. When we start going out with people, yeah. let's say for dinner or something, you're going to pay for the the the, the bill. You there and then you can send half the money to the other couple for the bull and they've got it. You don't have to worry about it. Right. How does Zelle, how does Zelle, 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 do they, do, does the sender uh, get charged or does the receiver? There's, get no, there's charge. no charge. There's no, there's no, no charge. charge. No. There's no charge. You, you just need, need the receiver's. One. Yeah, sorry. Right, you just need the receiver's information, either phone number or email that's connected that's to right. their bank. That's all you need. Okay. Thank you. How do they know which bank they have? If you go to your bank and put in transfers, 
it'll come up just like doing a transfer. It, right. it, it, it's yeah. listed under, instead of transfer uh, email, it'll come up uh, at the bottom as a yeah. Zell. And you just mm -hmm. go to the Zell and click on and start the paperwork and it'll launch <laughs> itself automatically. I have a question, please. Yes. My name is Myra Baum, and yes. uh, uh, at this time, I've been getting to sign a, a lot of petitions. And when I I go and I sign the petitions, and they ask me I know. My, my zip code, my email, and something else. I'm not sure I remember. Is should we? Sign these petitions. I don't mind. My, my rule of thumb is, if someone wants me to sign a petition, bring me a piece of paper. Bring me a piece of paper. I don't want to sign a petition. Particularly now, the elections are coming up now. I'm getting email and text messages to log in and sign. I just no. ignore them. I do, not, I do not sign anything for any. I don't know who it's coming from. And once you start giving them the information, you've had it. So if they, if if if, uh, if a candidate wants me to um, uh, vote for them or sign a petition or something, Very come to my house, make an appointment, bring me the, the the form. I'll sign the form in front of you, but not on the web. I don't sign on the web. Yeah, I yeah. A lot of that stuff is political now. Are you supporting Joe Biden? Are you supporting Trump? Are you supporting this congressperson, that senator, yeah. that type of thing? Right. So there was. Oh. <laughs> if you want to be with me, yeah, I'm previous mate, I'm sheriff, little pile. <laughs> if you want to be with me for another few minutes, there was another a program that I had mentioned a while ago, and Elaine wanted some explanation on it. Um, I use Capital One uh, credit card company. The Capital One has a feature called ENO, E-N-O. And what that does is the biggest chance for theft of your credit card is online, online shopping. So what that does is it, it gives you a virtual number linked to your credit card that is only valid for that vendor. So for example, you want to buy something on Amazon, I go into Eno, I generate a virtual number for only for Amazon. And then I go into Amazon and say, this is my payment method. You understand? So which which means you cannot use that number for Steinmark or for Target or anything. You can only use it for Amazon. If you want to get one for Target, you have to generate another number. And there's no limit to the number of numbers that you can generate. So you can have, but it's only for online. It's good. You can't use those numbers if you walk into Safeway and buy something. You can only use it for online shopping. So, and the other benefit to doing that is if they steal your information or steal your credit card, then you can lock that number. You do not have to shut down the whole credit card and go through the whole rigmarole of re-inventing, um, re-giving the new credit card number to all your people or your vendors. So if something happens, like... Um, you said you wanted to buy something on Facebook or, you know, or something like that. So let's say they you gave them your real credit card number. And now all of a sudden you're getting charges from India and whatever it is. Um, what you have to do is you have to shut down your credit card. But that credit card may be linked to your, uh, it may be linked to the gas company. It may be linked to, to, the, to wherever. Whereas if you use a virtual number, all you do is go in there and you, and you just lock the card, that, and nobody can charge that card again. But how would you know he, who, what card they're using? Um, if you're only using your virtual for, say, um, you said Amazon, 
So yeah. somebody uses my my other card. So okay, you have to do it for for each card. You can't use Eno uh, for uh, American Express. American Express most likely has their own one. But how do you know which credit card they're using? Yeah. For me, I, I have text alerts. So I get I a text. Too. I have I, text. So I get a text alert and I don't recognize the charge. Right. So I will go and have a look. And uh, I'll, then I can, when you get a text alert, it'll always come back with the last four numbers of the credit card in, right. the, text, in the text alert. So I'll go look at the Eno numbers and see which one it relates to. And I'll shut that off. So I had an incident uh, maybe four weeks ago where I saw a charge to AT and T for eighty something dollars. I don't have AT. I don't have AT and T. So I called the credit, and then about a minute later, I saw credit come from AT and T for eighty dollars. And then five minutes later, I saw another debit. Or fifty-seven dollars. So I called the credit card company and I said, "Let's have a look what's going on." She says, "Yeah, it looks like someone somewhere in another time zone has got your number." I said, "Good, because I don't even have AT and T. I don't have AT and T." She said, "Let me shut the doors." And she says, "Whoa, I'm just in the midst of shutting it off, and I see they're trying to charge another. They're trying to build another thing right now." So we shut it off. Of course, none of the charges came into my account, right. but we got it. Um, I would say I called the credit company within 10 minutes of receiving that first message. Right. I had the credit card company on the phone. So, you know, to get rid to, who knows what they, they could have spent $20,000. But that they was could, your virtual number. But, the but, virtual but, number, yeah. But yeah. I've got... I've got three credit cards, and in the past two years, all three of them have been, uh, and they're you know, different companies. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> it's only a matter I of have, time. Okay. I have City Card. Now, City Card offers a one time use anytime you want it, anywhere yes. you want it. Yes. And so you can go to any different site, and when they ask for your payment, you go to City Card and click one time use only. And you get a generated number that can never be used again by anybody, including right. that place. So I feel that's a little bit safer because oh, right. they can use it for a return. They can give you a credit back on it if you return the merchandise, but they can't charge another item to it. So I, I kind of do that when I'm shopping online. I feel that's safer. I also have city cards. So I, I just have to call them and ask yeah. them for that. And they can go online and set it up. Yeah. It's a one-time use card number. Oh, so just, interesting. Just remember that we are the targets. Yes. We yep. are the targets for all these scams. Yep. So you know, just be aware. You, you really, you gave me a good idea because I have a lot of charges, monthly charges on right. city because I get points for it. Right. right. So now I'm going to take them off and just pay them out of my bill pay out of my bank account. It's the, um, same, it's the same charge. I mean, it's the same thing. I know what I'm charging every month. Right. Right. So I'm going to lose the miles. But you know what? With this pandemic, we're not going we to. Go. Yeah, exactly. Right. So change it. Yeah. Good idea. Right. I have a question for you. This you was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, you and cookies, I know what they are, but what is a zombie cookie? It's like a, a sleeping cookie, and what it does is they place that on your computer, usually in the web browser, and at a certain uh, um, trigger point, it, it starts working. A cookie, a regular cookie, works all the time. Uh, you know, it, it keeps track of what you're doing all the time. A zombie will wait. So they can put a zombie in your computer and say activate in a month's time. So once it, so, so it's that, delayed, that, delayed action. Yes, delayed action, Advil, delayed action, Advil. <laughs> so it and and then 
those are also very difficult to find. Uh, you know, <coughs> you, you, if you follow the news, every day there's another uh, institution that's been breached, that's uh, Target has had everything stolen, and this one and that one, and they just can't keep up with it. But we're very lucky that they are breaching this because the banks and credit card companies would have zero uh, um, security. They would have zero security. So, so recently, so, uh, recently made political contributions through one outfit to several candidates. And after I think the third or fourth one, the card stopped. I got a thing from them that the card stopped. I called the credit card company and they said they weren't sure what was going on and that's why they stopped it. When I said it was legit, then they allowed me to put additional uh, bills on it. But they did so, stop it after about three, four transactions. Another thing that the alerts will do, um, a while back, last year sometime, we went to a restaurant and I paid the bill and I left the gratuity. I left the tip. The, the next, the, when the restaurants have your, your charges, they only go through the next day. So the next day, I get a text message from uh, Capital One saying, you left an 80% tip on this bill. Is it correct? So what they had done was, let's say I'd left eight, $18 tip. The waitress t changed it to $48. Wow. You understand? So yeah. those alerts will pick that up as well. Yeah. You understand? If you, if they find, th th their computers are programmed what your shopping habits are. You know, and if you all of a sudden change and you go somewhere else to shop, they'll come back to you and say, are you shopping over here? Did you buy this here? Because they don't want to be responsible and they want to catch it straight away. Yeah. Um, we call the credit card before we go abroad and tell them we will be, you know, in this country, and it, oh, but only uh, American, no, only the city card wanted that information. The uh, American don't Express you, didn't care. Yeah, they don't want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Visa doesn't care either. Yeah, and Apple doesn't care. And it's hard mm -hmm. to use an American Express in Europe anymore. Right. They a lot of places don't take it. Right. I don't use that one in Europe. I only use that one to buy gifts for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Because I get a separate, only my name oh. is on it, so only I get the bill. <laughs> but uh, also, um, I had a friend who got an email from us, and she said, did you send this to us? And I said, no, I don't remember sending that to you. We were doing something else, or we were out of the house at the time. So when I, I stupidly had opened it, and I looked, and I realized that the address of the person who sent it, it, it was our name, but it wasn't our credit, you know, wasn't yeah. our email. Interesting. So we immediately changed our password. Was that the thing to do? Whenever there's some action on your accounts, like mm -hmm. someone started, you change the password straight away. Yeah, we did. That's why if you go back to that formula that I showed you in the password. Do you want me to go back no. to it? I um, hold on a second. I'll show you now. Uh, so I didn't really need to change the whole thing. I could have changed one number. Right. So uh, you see what I what I did here? Mm -hmm. If you understand that all passwords have um, a, a minimum basic requirement, which is eight letters, eight characters, one uppercase, one number, and one symbol. So in the, in the, in the middle there, I've said, find a word, which I just said, Manasha Rivka. Um, one uppercase, any letter in, in the beginning. The one capital. Letter, one capital, mm -hmm. one number. You can put the number anywhere. And then one symbol. 
And okay, we don't even use a symbol, but okay. <laughs> most of the websites today are requiring a symbol. Oh. Um, and then when it, it's easy to remember because if you can't log into a website with the number 18, you know in your mind you've got to try 19, then you try 20. So <laughs> it's easy to, it's easy to um, recreate the password. Okay. You don't, you don't, don't want to make it too difficult. Do you yeah, use yeah. that same per password for everything? No, I change the numbers, but I use it through, I use it through Keeper. Okay. Is I mean, it? I have like a hundred uh, different passwords. And right. It's just generated, but it's, I don't know them. Yes. Well, that's, that's <laughs> a problem. Yeah, we have a sheet of paper. We write each one down. Right. <laughs> I hope you're doing codes. What happens if someone gets your paper? Uh, um. I actually do the same file thing. Cabinet. That. I, have, I have in my phone a notepad, but it's just hints. And it's sort of like what Izzy said. Is it an exclamation point at the end? Is it a question mark? That's what I do. Um, a question mm -hmm. that was in the chat that was sent to me privately. How safe are using the patient's portal that doctors or hospitals okay. set up? How safe? You have oh. no choice. Yeah. You have no choice. <laughs> Although I will tell you something, I was looking, I have a backup on my computer and the, the uh, secretary's computer here at the office crashed two days ago and her computer was being backed up with the same one. And I was just looking at pricing again and I went to Carbonite's website. And if you are a regulated by HIPAA laws, they offer a different backup, uh, meaning a more secure. So I'm assuming they're quite secure or as best as is offered. I wouldn't know the answer to that question. But definitely they have to take it to some degree. Now, what do you guys say? Right. In the old days, they would just send you the information. <laughs> the old days is no more. <laughs> Although I did get one receptionist to send me my uh, lab results. <laughs> so, so just one other caution about saving your logins and passwords. Mm -hmm. A lot of people use the contact list in your phone or your computer. So they'll put their Bank of America and they'll put the password in the login and capital one. Well, your contact list in your phone in your computer is an open book. It's, there is no security. It's convenient because you know where it is, but there's absolutely no security in, in doing that. So you shouldn't ever put save login. No, never yeah. put a My husband never put it. a password, a login, or or, or uh, critical information into your contact list. It's, it's oh, no good. yeah, that's why the uh, the program like Keeper or Dashlane is secure. It actually is quite secure. So that's why we use that separately, but not not a contact list, and not the notes in the in the computer or in the phone. You don't put passwords there. That notes is saying, you know, buy a loaf of bread at Safeway, but not for putting your critical information. <laughs>